video we're going to discuss some general issues of sight and stereo selectivity in electrophilic additions to alkenes. But before we get into the details of these, I want to talk about sight selectivity and stereo selectivity in general. Sight selectivity refers to a situation in which a reaction can form one of two possible constitutionally isomeric products. A site selective reaction is one in which one of the two possible constitutional isomers is heavily favored over the other. Stereoselectivity is similar in that we're starting from a common set of reactants, but now instead of two possible constitutional isomers, there are two possible stereoisomers that could form. And these might be enantiomers or diastereomers. In the context of electrophilic addition, we're interested in diastereomers. In many electrophilic additions, one diastereomer is heavily favored over another for mechanistic reasons. The site selectivity issue in electrophilic addition becomes clear if we consider an asymmetrically substituted alkene, one with two different sets of substituents on the two carbons involved in the double bond. And this is a general problem for any reaction that uses a bond as a nucleophile. When we use a bond which involves a shared pair of electrons, as a nucleophile, we have to make a decision about which of the two atoms involved in the bond retains the electrons after they're donated to the electrophile. Let's consider a very simple electrophile H plus here. From a curved arrow alone, it's actually impossible to tell which of the two atoms of this alkene involved in the double bond, the two carbons, actually forms a bond to H plus. Coordination of the hydrogen to the carbon on the right is going to leave a positive charge this carbon on the left. Coordination of the carbon on the left to this proton is going to leave a positive charge on the other carbon. This leads to a site selectivity issue. Here's a specific example of this phenomenon in action. The two carbons involved in the alkene are not equivalent. This carbon bears a hydrogen and a carbon group. This carbon is linked to two carbon groups and so their substitution patterns are different. If electron flow occurs so that the blue carbon retains the electrons and coordinates to the proton embedded within HCl, the resulting product looks like this, with a positive charge on the red highlighted carbon. Of course, if the pi bond coordinates to the proton in such a way that the other carbon retains the electrons and actually forms a bond to hydrogen here, the product that we end up with is isomeric, constitutionally isomeric, with the one above. Now a new CH bond has formed at the other carbon of the alkene, leaving the top carbon, the carbon highlighted blue in the starting material, with a positive charge. What we're seeing here is that using the pi electrons as a nucleophile results in a situation where two isomeric products are possible. And one thing I'll go ahead and mention now is that after chloride coordinates to the positively charged carbons, we still end up with isomeric alkyl halides. Chloride bonds to the carbon that had the positive charge in the carbocation intermediate. But looking all the way at these final products doesn't tell us a whole lot, since the step that really decides the site selectivity is this uphill generation of the carbocation, the key A sub E step. And this is true of electrophilic additions in general. It's coordination of the electrophile to the pi bond, an A sub E elementary step or analogous step that really controls the site selectivity in electrophilic additions. There's a famous rule about the site selectivity of electrophilic additions to alkenes, and it's called Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule says that the electrophilic atom, here the proton of HCl, forms a bond to the less substituted carbon preferentially. Notice that the red highlighted carbon here is less substituted. What this rule tells us in this case is that the bottom pathway is favored over the top pathway and that the major product will involve placing chlorine at the more substituted position after it coordinates to this carbocation. What Markovnikov's rule really comes down to is an issue of carbocation stability. It's not really about what's bonded to what in the products. It's about this key question, which carbocation is more stable? We've seen previously that more substituted carbocations are more stable due to an inductive effect. From this stability trend, we can immediately conclude that the electrophilic atom will coordinate to the less substituted atom so that positive charge ends up on the more substituted atom involved in the double bond. In this particular example, the electrophilic atom coordinates to the less substituted carbon, leaving positive charge on the more substituted carbon. 
There are anti-Markovnikov additions overall, in which this opposite selectivity is apparently observed, but there are good mechanistic explanations for anti-Markovnikov reactions as well. These don't involve carbocationic intermediates. Addition across the atoms of a carbon-carbon pi bond converts two trigonal carbons into two tetrahedral carbons. And these tetrahedral carbons may well be stereocenters if the starting trigonal carbons began with two different groups attached on their ends. This creates an interesting stereochemical issue. Because two stereocenters are set, we have the potential for diastereomers to form. And in the language of additions to alkenes, we talk about additions that add groups to the same side or opposite sides of the plane formed by the alkene. These are referred to as syn and anti-addition, respectively. Let's look at some examples. In a syn addition, E and Y, both the electrophilic atom and the counter atom or leaving group, add to the same side of the double bond. Let's look at trans-2-butene, a substrate in which the alkene carbons will become stereocenters after the addition of an electrophilic reagent, EY. When addition occurs in a syn fashion, both E and Y approach trans-2-butene from the same side. Although these approaches could happen in multiple elementary steps, just to make the point that E and Y approach from the same side, I'll draw them doing so in a single step here. This direction of approach sets the configurations of the stereocenters developing at the alkene carbons. If we leave all four of the carbons of trans-2-butene in the plane of the screen, both E and Y will be pointed out towards us like this in the product, and the hydrogens will both be pushed back, like so. What makes this syn addition is the fact that E and Y have ended up on the same side of the plane formed by the alkene carbons and their substituents. Anti-addition, as we'll see shortly, results in the formation of a diastereomer of the syn addition product. Let's again consider trans-2-butene. In an anti-addition, E and Y end up on opposite sides of the plane formed by the alkene carbons and their substituents. So let's once again draw kind of a sideways view of trans-2-butene and see what an anti-addition looks like. In an anti-addition, often, in fact almost always in multiple elementary steps, E and Y approach opposite sides of the plane of the double bond. Notice that anti-addition is going to result in the formation of a diastereomer of the syn addition product. In both cases, E is approaching from the same side of the alkene plane. Where the two pathways differ is in the trajectory of Y. It comes from underneath in the anti-case, opposite E, and it comes from above on the same side as E in the syn case. In the resulting product, in the resulting product, the configuration of the stereocenter bearing E is the same as it is in the syn case. The key difference comes in the configuration of the stereocenter bearing Y. Now Y is pointed back away from us since it came from underneath, and the hydrogen linked to that stereocenter is pointed up towards us. One reason this is called anti-addition is because the carbon E and carbon Y bonds are actually anti in the most stable conformation of the product. Notice that these two bonds have a 180 degree dihedral angle in this conformation. Most addition reactions are stereoselective or stereospecific for either syn or anti-addition, although some reactions give a mixture of the two. When it comes to stereochemistry in electrophilic addition reactions, though, the favored pathway is strongly dictated by the mechanism. And this is an important point to keep in mind. The stereoselectivity, or stereospecificity, as the case may be, is an important aspect of the mechanism that we want to take note of as we explore the specific mechanisms of electrophilic additions. One final point to mention is that although the syn and anti-addition products for a particular reagent EY are diastereomeric, each of the molecules here in general is chiral meaning it has an enantiomer that can form via approach of the electrophile just to the opposite face, right? Imagine if E approached from the bottom rather than the top in both cases. We would end up with enantiomers of what's drawn here. Enantioselective electrophilic additions are beyond the scope of Chem 2311 because they require either a chiral electrophile or some kind of chiral catalyst to bias one enantiomer over the other. So when drawing products of these reactions, it's always okay to focus on a single enantiomer. A racemic mixture of enantiomers is implied in cases when we generate a chiral product.